Preparing for Harvest. This series is going to lead into a harvest banquet. Like Rhonda was talking about, the banquet's going to be across the street. And that banquet is an opportunity for you to invite friends, family, people you've been praying for. Because like Pastor Carl said, we're going to be having testimonies. It's an opportunity. It's like a, it's like a stepping stone. It breaks down the wall for them to come in and be around the church without being in church. It allows them to be around the body of Christ and to be loved by the people of God. So if you have friends and family and they might be, I don't really want to go to church just yet, it's an opportunity. They might be willing to go to that. So that's what this whole series is leading up to. And when we talk about preparing for harvest, we're talking about souls. And just like a harvest doesn't just grow and end up in the barn, so souls are not just going to get saved and end up in church. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some proper steps to get a harvest. And this series has been all about those, those proper steps. The first part of the series was preparing the laborers. If you're going to have a harvest, you've got to have people to go work the harvest field. That's us. We've got to be prepared and ready to do the work. The second part, which we're in right now, is preparing to sow. In order to have a harvest, you've got to sow seed. And this message I'm preaching today is going to lead us into the last part of our series, which is preparing for rain. You've got to have rain fall on that seed in order for something to grow. That's, we get that through prayer, through fasting. And all these things are vital to experience a harvest. You must have laborers, you must sow seed, and you must have rain. But we're talking about a harvest. Not a piece of wheat, not one stalk of something, but a harvest. We're not talking about experiencing one soul get saved. We're not talking about experiencing one life change. We're talking about souls, plural. What we're really talking about is experiencing revival. When we sing that, let revival come, we're talking about, when we talk about the harvest, we're talking about revival. We're talking about the people of God getting revived to go do the work of God so that souls can come in. Not one soul, souls. We're talking about revival. Revival is when the church, the people of God, get revived. It starts with us. It starts with us waking up from our slumber. It starts with us getting out of our church chairs and getting out of the four walls and going to work the harvest field. It starts with us. It starts with us sharing our faith and sharing the gospel. And as a result of that, revival sees people pouring in. And when people pour in, you start seeing a move of God take place. You start seeing God moving on people. You start seeing him convicting people and drawing people to him. You start seeing people get saved and get healed and get delivered. You start seeing a great move of God. There have been many great revivals in history, from the day of Pentecost to the Browns Revival in Pensacola. But here's the thing about revival. They don't just happen by accident. You'll never hear a revival story where the pastor or the people in church say, I don't know what happened. We were just having normal service and God just started moving on us and God just started healing people and delivering people. No, there was always steps that those men of God took preparing for revival, leading up to revival. Things that were sown to produce these great moves of God. And that's what I'm preaching on today. Today's message is entitled, Seeds of Revival. Things that must be sown in order to experience a move of God. Seeds of revival. If you are going to see revival, there's things that must be sown, and we are the ones who sow them. Revival is not just going to happen. So I'm going to be preaching out of 1 and 2 Samuel this morning. I'm preaching on King David, a man named Joab, and a stronghold that set itself up in Jerusalem that David wanted to take down. So we're going to start by reading the back part of um, David and Goliath's story because it's going to set up this message perfect. 1 Samuel 17, 36 through 37 and verse 54. David said this, he said, Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Verse 54, after David killed Goliath, it says, and David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. 
David beats Goliath. And then David cuts off Goliath's head. Many people don't even read this or even seek to understand what was really happening here. He cuts off Goliath's head. And this young man, he's walking with this head of Goliath. I'm sure people were saying, David, where are you going? He says, I got some business to take care of. Now he's walking. He's carrying this giant's head by his hair and he's walking. He's walking with purpose. He's walking with passion. He walks to Jerusalem. Now at the time, Jerusalem had a, a certain area that was occupied by Jebusites. This area was known as Jebus, also Canaanites. This area was a stronghold. The Bible says it was a stronghold. They had walls that were extremely high. They had gates that were extremely thick. There was no way into this place. Many people tried to take down this stronghold, but failed. And the reason why it was so strong is because they could be locked in for a long time because they had an underground water system that flowed and came up inside of the city. So they could be in there for a long time because they had fresh water. So David, David comes to it, and David buries the head of Goliath right outside the city. You got that picture in your mind? Because we're coming back to it. All right. Let's move on. So David eventually becomes king over Judah. He reigns king over Judah for seven and a half years. Now, Judah is only one tribe of Israel. There's 12 tribes of Israel. They made, they made David king over one of the tribes. Okay, David, we're going to make you king over Judah, but the other 11 tribes, the other 11 regions, they're going to belong to another king. When the king over the other 11 tribes died, they made David king over all the tribes. Let's read that. First Chronicles 11, 3 through 7. Therefore, all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David king over Israel, according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were, the inhabitants of the land. But the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, you shall not come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Now David said, whoever attacks the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. And Joab, the son of Zariah, went up first and became chief. Then David dwelt in the stronghold. Therefore, they called it the city of David. I want you to notice something. David defeats Goliath. The stronghold's still there. David cuts off Goliath's head. He brings Goliath's head to, to Jerusalem. He buries the head. He gets victory over the giant. Stronghold's still there. He becomes king over Judah, stronghold still there. The moment they made David king over all 12 tribes, the moment they made David king over all the land, the moment they gave David authority over all the land, the moment they did that, he said, I'm going to take that stronghold. The moment they made David king over everything, that's when the stronghold came down. The reason why so many people still have strongholds in their life is not because Jesus didn't get victory at the cross. It's not that Jesus didn't take down Satan and crush his head. It's because that you've only made Jesus Lord and King over one area of your life. You see, Jesus, I'll make you King over this area, but the other 11 areas of my life, that belongs to something else, and you wonder why strongholds are still there. It wasn't until they made David King over everything that strongholds came down. If there are strongholds still in your life, I would ask you to survey the land. Figure out what area you have not made Jesus king of and then make him king. Jesus cannot be king of your salvation, but not king of your marriage. Jesus cannot be king of your finances, but not king over your children and over your job and over your mouth and over your ears and over your eyes. Jesus must be king over all if you're going to see strongholds come down in your life and in the lives of people around you. Jesus must be king. The moment David becomes king over all of Israel, he goes straight to the stronghold and the inhabitants of that stronghold start shouting. The blind and the lame repel you, David. They start shouting at David. The blind and the lame repel you. 
you'll never get in here. They would shout from inside their stronghold. See, we're talking about sowing seeds, but how many know this? How many know the devil sows seeds too? How many know the enemy would have would sow seeds in your mind? Seeds of doubt, seeds of discouragement. The enemy seeks to mock you and make you doubt yourself. The enemy was trying to sow seeds in, of fear in David when he was facing Goliath by the things that Goliath was shouting at David. These Jebusites were also trying to plant seeds in David by saying, even a blind and lame can take you. Like, come on, David. You're not getting in this place. David, you're too small. David, you're too weak. You're too inexperienced, David. You don't know enough to take down this stronghold. You see, this stronghold's been here too long. David, you're not getting in here. This stronghold will remain. You see that stronghold of anxiety and depression and fear? It's been in your life too long, and you don't have what it takes to take down that stronghold. You hear those voices. David, that sickness has been in your mother too long. It's rooted. It's planted. Forget about it. You don't have what it takes to see that stronghold come down. Your dad's too lost. Your children are too gone. That addiction's been there too long. That stronghold is there. Forget about it. You don't have what it takes to overcome. These are seeds that the enemy is trying to plant in you to make you doubt that strongholds come down. Like I said, David heard the same voice from Goliath. And you know what his response was? He said, I killed the lion and I killed the bear. And you're going to go down just like them. See, when they began to shout at David, David didn't respond to them. When them Jebusites started shouting, even the blind and lame repel you, he didn't respond. I believe David was standing over that place where he buried that giant's head. I believe he was standing over the place where he buried that giant's head and he was looking at that and he was thinking, yeah, your walls are big, but I've seen things come down before. Yeah, you might be strong, but I've seen strong men come down before and you're going to come down just like this giant came down. It was a seed he had planted right there. That head was a seed, a seed of what? A seed of victory. You have got to learn what it is to plant seeds of victory in your life. Things that you can look back on and say, my God did it before, he'll do it again. See, seeds of victory produce faith. When you're standing before a mountain, when you're standing before a stronghold, you can look back at those seeds that were planted in your life and you can say, my God moved before, he'll move again. My God took down giants in my past, he'll take down giants in my future. David never looked at his past, his, his future giants. He always looked at his past victories. He's standing before Goliath. He sees his giant. He says, wait up a second here. God was with me with the lion and the bear. He, he was with me then. He'll be with me now. When it came time to face the Jebusites and they were shouting about how great their walls were and how weak he was, he remembered, my God was with me then. He'll be with me in, in the future. Always have seeds of victory. They'll produce faith to take the strongholds that stand in front of you. Always remember, the word of God says that we overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. When the enemy throws something on you, the word of your testimony, that is your past victory that Jesus gave you over your life, over sin and the devil. And when the enemy stands before you, I could look back and say, wait up a second here. My God got me through so much before and he ain't leaving me now. Seeds of victory will produce faith, mountain moving, stronghold, tearing down, giant slaying faith. Seeds of victory must be planted in order for you to see revival. When the enemy tries to plant seeds in my mind about this church, about the size of this church, there's a seed of victory that I turn to. It's a past revival that took place at a little place called Azusa Street. This church was 60 feet deep, 40 feet wide. What's the size of this church? 60 feet deep, 40 feet wide? So when enemy says that church is too small, I got a seed of victory that says, no, God moved in a church this side. Revival lasted three years. Thousand got saved. Crutches got thrown down. Wheelchairs got thrown down. 
When the enemy starts telling me this church is too small, I got to see the victory. And I say, no, he did it before and he'll do it again. See, that's what I can look back on. Seeds of victory produce revival shaking faith. I know he'll do it again. Thousands got saved in those three years. Thousands. And out of that came the Pentecostal charismatic movement, which there are over 500 million Pentecostals today. 500 million Pentecostals in the world today that came out of a church that was 60 feet deep, 40 feet wide. Don't tell me my God can't do it. Those seeds of victory in your past are to help you get through the next thing that stands in front of you. You know, when I look over my life, I wonder why God allowed me to see so many things at such a young age. You know, God allowed David to get victory over a lion and a bear and Goliath when he was still a boy. Why did he allow David to get those victories? Why did he allow me to get victories? Why did he allow me to see the dead race and blind eyes open? Why did he allow me to see my grandma get healed of having a stroke and it leaving her uh, well, it was, you know, being able to speak? Why did God allow me to do that? Because he knew I'd be standing right here. And I would need those past victories to give me the faith to lead this church to revival. See, the enemy lets you go through so many things in your life. And he gave you victory over all those things because he knows what's ahead of you. And he knows you're going to need those past victories to have faith to see the strongholds in your future come down. That's why he allows you to go through so many things. Every time you go through something, it's painful. You don't want to go through it. But God shows up and gives you victories, and he plants those victories right here in your mind. Because what's ahead of you, you're going to need those things. You're going to need those past victories to remind you, my God can do it. Now, David doesn't say anything back to the Jebusites. I wish he would have. I wish he would have. I wish he would have looked at that at that place where he buried that giant's head and said, he came down and you will too. I wish he would have said one down, one to go. But he didn't say nothing. He didn't say anything. David starts talking to his army. David starts talking to the people of God. And he reveals his plan to overtake this stronghold. He comes up with a war plan. He says, listen, he says, the way in is through that water system. He says, somebody's going to have to get in that water system. He said, it's dark. There's no lights. You're going to have to get in there, and you're going to have to let that water, that current, push you right on through that system. But you're going to come out. You're going to come out. You're going to see the light. And when you see that light, when you're in that shaft, it was like a well, you have to climb it. And he said, when you get out, open the door, because I'm going to be right there. When you go through that system, when you come out of that darkness, when you go up that shaft, when you get in that city and you're in the middle of that stronghold, all I need you to do from that point on is just open up the door and I and the army is going to be waiting right there to come rushing in. A man named Joey volunteers, I'll do it. I'll be your inside guy. I'll be your inside guy. Jesus has a plan to overtake the stronghold. He has a plan to overtake the strongholds in your life, and he has a plan to overtake the stronghold in Metairie, Kenner, New Orleans. He has a plan to overtake the stronghold, and he says, all I need is an inside guy. All I need is somebody on the inside that would simply go through the right steps and open up the door so that I can come in. That's all I need you to do. I just need somebody on the inside. The door is unlocked from the inside. So let's look at, at the steps Joab took. Joab, he gets in this water system. It was dark. There was no flashlights back then. It was, it was a tunnel full of water pushing you through. There's no light. It's darkness. But in order for him to survive this, he had to allow the current to push him right on through. He had to allow the current of that water to push him through the darkness. The Bible says in Romans 8, 13 through 14, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The spirit of God will lead you through darkness. 
the Spirit of God, the current of God, the flow of God will lead you right through darkness. He'll start convicting you. He will start drawing you. He will start pushing you right on through the darkness. And it's the sons of God that yield themselves to the Spirit and let him lead them out of darkness. Let him lead them to put things to death. If you're here and you say, you know what, I'm still, I'm still living in sin, it's okay, you're not being led by the Spirit of God. Putting things to death, overcoming, overcoming darkness and overcoming sin, that's a mark of a true son. That's how you know you're a son and a daughter of God, because you let him lead you out of the darkness. You let him lead you out of sin. Joab knew he had to go through that pipe and come out of the darkness in order to open the gate for David. There's steps that we have to take in order to see revival, and you can't skip any of these steps. So let me ask you this. What would it have looked like if Joab would have gotten that pipe, let the, let the current take him for a little bit, maybe find a little air pocket in the pipe, come up about halfway through, and say this is far enough? What would have happened if he had went about halfway through and said, you know what, like so many Christians, I'm not where I was, but I know I'm not where, where, where the king wants me. See, I know I'm not in a position to be used by the king, but I'm just going to settle in right here. You see, I got rid of all these sins. There's some sins to go, but I think I'm just going to hunker down right here. What would have happened to that man? What would it have looked like if halfway through the pipe, halfway through the darkness, he would have stopped, settled, and then started shouting from the pipe? What if right there he would have started shouting, King David is going to take you down. They up there, they're like, what, where is that voice coming from? David is going to take this stronghold. He's going to take this city. He's going to come rushing in. David is going to take you down. What would that have looked like? It looks like many Christians who are still living in darkness, shouting from their darkness. Jesus can heal you. Jesus can deliver you. Jesus can save you. And they're like, this dude's speaking from the darkness. This man's still in darkness, and he's going to tell me what Jesus can do for me? This man's still in sin, and he's going to tell me that Jesus is a deliverer? You're still in darkness, and yet you, you're making proclaims about what Jesus can do? First, come out of the darkness. Before the church will experience revival, they must first repent and come out of darkness. Repentance is not something that's preached from the pulpit. And that's why you're not seeing any revivals taking place. The church has to be revived first. The church has to experience repentance. The second seed that must be sown in order to see revival is a seed of repentance. A seed of repentance. If you want to see Jesus come and take down your stronghold, if you want to see Jesus come in your life, in your church, in your city, Repentance is a seed that must be sown in order to experience revival. When John the Baptist was preaching, he was preaching repentance. He said, I'm a voice in the wilderness preparing the way for the Lord. Repent. Make straight paths. He said, listen, if you want to see Jesus move into the city, if you want to see Jesus come in, there's a step you've got to take. There's a seed that must be sown. It's the seed of repentance. The moment those people started jumping in the water and getting repent repenting, Jesus came bursting on the scene. You want to know why Jesus is not bursting in the churches? Because they're not repenting. Because they want to live in their darkness, they want to stay in their darkness, and they want to make shouts from their darkness. Repentance always precedes revival. There was a revival that took place in London from 1738 to 1791, led by a, name, a man named John Wesley. This man's message was simple. Repentance, holiness, and faith. That's what he preached. Repentance, holiness, and faith. That revival saw 1.25 million people come to Jesus Christ. 1.25 million came to Christ, and the message was simple. Repent. Live holy lives. Have faith in Jesus Christ. You don't hear that from the pulpit no more. People don't want to hear it. Leave me in my darkness. I'll make some shouts from there. The door will never be open. When the church repents and comes out of darkness, revival breaks out. 
Souls get saved, lives get healed, marriages get restored. So my question to the church this morning is this. How bad do you want revival? How bad do you want it? How bad do you want to see your family get saved? How bad do you want to see your father and your mother in the kingdom of God? How bad do you want to see when children come in here with handicaps that they get healed? They get restored. How bad do you want to see wheelchairs getting thrown in a trash can? How bad do you want to see revival break out? How bad do you want it? Do you want it more than you want your drugs? Do you want it more than you want your alcohol and your pornography and your lust and your fornication and your adultery? Do you want it more than that? Because that's what it's going to take to see revival. Sowing seeds of repentance. You're going to have to throw some things in the ground. You're going to have to throw th some things off of you if you're going to see revival come. You've got to want revival more than you want your sin. You've got to want to see Jesus move on your family, move in this area. You've got you to want revival more than you want your sin. So how bad do you want it? How bad do you want to see your family saved? How bad do you want to see your children saved? How bad do you want to see your mother, your father healed? How bad do you want it? It starts with repentance. First comes repentance. The next thing that comes is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. See, John was preaching the baptism of repentance. That's the first step. But he said, but, but one's coming after me. Second step. He said, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. First step is repentance. The second step is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The world is going to have to see people who have done more than just, than just repent and come out of their darkness. The world is going to have to see more than just people who sit in the church on a Sunday morning. The world is going to have to see people that are filled with God's Holy Spirit and God's holy fire. The world is going to have to see people who are burning for the things of God. Jesus. You know, when, when Joab went through the darkness, what did he look like when he came out? He was a man that was drenched. He was a man that was soaked. That represents being baptized in the Holy Spirit. When that man came out of darkness, what did that area see when they looked at that man? They saw a man that was completely soaked. This man was dripping. The world is going to have to see people who are soaked in the presence of God, soaked with the Spirit of God. They're going to have to see more than just religion. They have to see more than just somebody who's inviting them to church. They have to see somebody who is completely soaked with the presence of God. You want to see revival? It starts with that. The baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, whether you want to call it being drenched or on fire for God, it's the same thing. Leonard Ravenhill said this. He said, if you want to see revival, let a man start burning for God. He said, you don't have, have to advertise a fire. He said, people will come to watch it burn. He said, if you want to see revival, let a man get on fire for God. He said, people will come to watch him burn. People will come to see that man burn for God. They will come to see a man with fire in his eyes and passion in his heart. They'll come to see it. You want revival? Don't just come out of darkness. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's what leads to revival. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is what sparked the first great revival. Acts chapter 2. When the Spirit of God fell on the 120 in the upper room, the Bible says they began to speak in tongues. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost. Because of that baptism, the first thing the world saw when they came out was men that were filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit. Peter preached. And 3,000 got saved one day. That's what's called revival. The church got revived. They got filled with the Holy Ghost. They went out into a world. And the world saw men that were burning for God. And they preached the gospel. And thousands got saved. That's revival. That's revival. Azusa Street, which I talked about earlier, started from a, man, a pastor named William Seymour. He preached the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That was his message, and it sparked revival. These are all seeds that must be sown if you're going to see revival, repentance, baptism of the Holy Ghost. 
Now with Joab, he goes through the darkness. He's drenched. He's standing in the middle of this stronghold. You've got to picture it. He goes through the pipe. He climbs out. He's soaked. He's drenched. And now he's standing in the middle of this stronghold. He didn't try to overthrow the stronghold on his own. He didn't try to take it down on his own strength. He would have been killed. See, many people today, many people in church would say this. Man, I came out of sin. I came out of darkness. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. And yet I still have strongholds in my life. What is, what's going on here? It's because you're trying to overcome those strongholds in your own strength and ability. It's not for you. The battle is not mine. The battle is the Lord's. If you're going to see strongholds come down, you've got to do the same thing Joab did. Run to the door and open up the door and let the king of glory come in. You want to see strongholds come down? Open the door and let Jesus. It's his battle, not yours. David's on the other side of the door and he's waiting for Joab to open it. He's on the other side of the door. He's ready for battle. He's ready to take down this stronghold. He's ready to see this city get taken down. Jesus is on the other side of the door. He's ready to come in. He's ready. See, this sounds like Christians. In a personal stronghold or in a city that has a stronghold, and we start wondering where Jesus is. Could you imagine if Joab would have been in the middle of that stronghold and started questioning where David was? If he would have been standing in the middle of that stronghold, he's out of darkness, he's full of the Holy Ghost, and he's wondering why he's surrounded, and he's wondering why the stronghold's still standing, and he's wondering what's going on, all he had to do was open up the door and let the king come in. That's all he had to do. David was waiting on Joab to open the door. Can I tell you something this morning? We are not waiting on revival. Revival is waiting on us. We are not waiting on Jesus. Jesus is waiting on us. He's waiting for us to take the proper steps to open up the door so he can come in. Heaven, we're not waiting on heaven. Heaven's waiting on you. Heaven's waiting on me. Heaven's waiting on us to take the proper steps to open up the door. Listen. We always pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2, and I hate to tell you this, he did not leave. We are not waiting for another outpouring. He is here. He's waiting on us to open up the door for him to come in. Joab wasn't waiting on David. David was waiting on Joab. David was waiting on Joab to open up the door so that he can take down the stronghold. Jesus is waiting on you personally to open up the door so he can take down the strongholds in your life. But he's waiting on us as a church to open up the door so he can take down the strongholds that are in our area. Strongholds of addiction, all the strongholds that surround this area, they will come down if we would just take the proper steps and let Jesus in. But I like the scene because I picture David. I picture David standing on the other side of the door. I'm looking at it from his perspective. He's on the other side of the door, and, and David's men ask, what are we doing here, David? I got a plan. What are we waiting for, David? What's, what's going on? How are we going to get into this stronghold, David? David just smiles. The men know David's got a plan. Do you have a plan, David? David says, I, I do. You see, I have, a, I have a man on the inside. I have a man on the inside. He was a man that was willing to go through the pipes. He was a man that was willing to go through the darkness. He was a man that was willing to climb out. He was a man that was willing to get soaked. And any minute now, he's going to be that man that's going to open up the door. And when he does, I'm going in. Jesus is standing on the other side of the door as well. You don't believe me? Read Revelations. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hears my voice, I will come in and be with him. He's talking to the church. If the church would open up the door and let Jesus come in. He's standing at the other side of the door waiting to come into the church, waiting to move in your area. But I picture Jesus standing outside of strongholds. I picture Jesus standing outside of these doors and the angels. They ask him, how are you planning on getting in there? 
Jesus, how are you planning on getting into that school? How are you planning on getting into that family? How are you planning on getting inside that church? How are you planning on getting inside that area? And Jesus just smiles. He says, I have an inside man. You see, I got a man on the inside. I got a man who was willing to come out of the darkness. I got a man who didn't love the darkness so much. I got a man who was willing to let my spirit lead him through the darkness and climb out of that shaft. I got a man who was full of my spirit. And I got a man who's going to do everything it takes to open up the door. And when he opens up that door, I'm coming in. You are his plan. His plan for revival starts with you taking the proper steps. He is at the door and he's waiting for a church to take the proper steps, to repent, to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Jesus is waiting on us. Psalm 24, verse 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he? The King of glory, the Lord mighty. He is the King of glory. Open the gate and let the King of glory come in. You know what that means? Open up the gate and let them come in. That means the person it's talking to is on the inside and the king of glory is on the outside. And the only thing that's standing between us and the king of glory is these gates. And if we would open up, come in. Behold, I say to the door, if any man would open the door, we're on the inside. He's at the door. All we have to do is open the door. Joab is on the inside. David is on the outside. Strongholds there. All he had to do was open the door. Heaven's waiting on you. So how do we open the door? The third seed of revival that opens the door is prayer. People don't want to hear all this. They don't want to hear repentance. They don't want to hear prayer. They don't want to hear that. But it's what's necessary. That's why revival is not taking place. This will be preached. The third seed of revival that opens the door is prayer. Prayer is a seed that must be sown in order to see revival. The first revival in the book of Acts didn't start with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It started before that, Acts 1.14. They all joined together constantly in prayer. Along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. These disciples, they prayed for 10 days straight. They prayed for 10 days straight for Jesus to come in, for the, for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. They prayed for 10 days straight. Brownsville Revival in Pensacola, also known as the Pensacola Outpouring, it lasted from 1995 to 2000. Over 4 million passed through those doors. Over 200,000 gave their heart and life to Jesus Christ at that time. And the evangelist Steve Hilly preached the message of repentance on Father's Day. And it opened up the door for revival. But what people don't know is this, is that seeds were sown long before that day. Revival doesn't just happen. 1993, two years before the revival, Pastor John Kilpatrick, the pastor of that church, started praying every single morning. Before the sun came up, he would go in his sanctuary, still in his pajamas, and he would pray for revival. Two years straight. Over 700 days of praying to see revival take place. He was so in prayer seeds. The reason why we're not seeing revival is because Christians don't want to pray anymore. You'd be surprised if you ask people in, in the church, even in here, how many hours a week do you pray? Right there would be your answer why you're not seeing revival. Right there. They don't want to pray because prayer is like a seed that you sow and for a period of time you don't see anything happening so we give up. I prayed for revival. Nothing happened. I prayed for my wife's healing. I prayed for my family. Nothing happened. 
I prayed for salvations. I prayed for this church. Nothing happened. How long did you pray for? Man, I prayed three days straight. Wow. Wow. This man prayed for 700 days straight before he saw anything. What happens with it is it's just like sowing a seed. You sow a seed into the ground and you don't see nothing. And you water it and you water it and you water it and you don't see nothing. And what happens with prayer is people pray one day and they got their fire. Man, I'm going to see it happen. And then the second day, a little less passion. And then the third day, I'm not seeing nothing. And by the fourth day, they're done praying. Prayer is a seed that is planted. And you might not see nothing for a long time. But it's necessary to see revival. In the Far East, they say this. There's a tree called the Chinese bamboo tree. This tree doesn't break through the ground for the first four years. You plant a seed and you don't see nothing for four years. You water it, you tend it, you look at it, nothing, four years. But they say in the fifth year, the tree begins to grow at an astonishing rate. They say it shoots out the ground and literally it can grow as tall as 90 feet. That's what prayer looks like. You pray, you don't see nothing. You pray, you pray for months, you pray for years. You don't see nothing, but you keep on praying. Paul said, be consistent in prayer. Pray without ceasing. Don't stop praying. He wasn't joking. If you're going to see a move of God, it's going to take prayer. It's going to take persistent, consistent prayer. Prayer is the third seed that must be sown for revival. Prayer is the thing that opens up the door for Jesus. The fourth thing that opens the door for revival is worship. Acts 16, 25 through 26. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open. And everyone's bands were loose. What did Paul and Silas do in order to see doors open, in order to see prison, prisoners get set free? What did Paul and Silas do in order to see chains fall? Pray and worship. They opened the door to revival. Everybody's chains fell. Not one person, everybody. Everybody's prison doors open. That's a picture of revival where people come into the church and because of prayer and worship, chains start to fall, prison doors start opening, but it started with them praying and worshiping. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. That literally when we start praying and we start praising, God begins to move on our praises. That he comes into the midst of your praise. It opens the door for God to start moving in the place. Worship. That's why we as a church, we need to take worship seriously. Because when we worship, it opens the door for healings. It opens the door for miracles. Listen, when I first got saved, even before that, I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ during worship. Not during a message, during worship. God started revealing himself to me during worship. Because when you worship, God starts to move into place. God starts to convict hearts. God starts to draw people. Worship is very serious. I believe when we worship, we're in the presence of God. That's not a time to joke around. It's not a time to play around. It's not a time to check your cell phone and the scores of the game. It's not a time to go out in the hallway and get you a cup of coffee and high five somebody. I'm all for the joy of the Lord. I'm all for having fun. But I believe in reverence for worship. I believe when we worship, we're literally in the presence of God. Because listen, if we're not in the presence of God when we worship and all we're doing is singing songs to four walls, I'm going home. I'm going home. I didn't, I didn't wake up this morning and I didn't give my life to come and stand around and, and just sing songs with people. I came to worship a living God. And I believe that if we were standing in heaven before the throne of God worshiping him, you wouldn't be going outside to get a cup of coffee. You wouldn't be going to get you some water. You wouldn't be telling a joke to the person next to you. You would take that very serious. Worship opens the door for God to move in. 
You bring in people in, you want to see them get saved, healed, and delivered? Worship. God will start moving in that place. God will start moving on your friends and on your family. Worship. The last thing that opens the door for revival is the gospel. Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew and then for the Gentile. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power for salvation unto anyone who believes. The gospel opens up the door for somebody to get saved. The gospel opens up the door for salvation. Now, here's the thing. Salvation is not a thing. Salvation is a person. It's the person of Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. And somebody gets saved, not when they receive a thing, but when they receive the Savior into their life. And what opens up that door for the Savior to come into somebody's life? The gospel. The gospel must be preached. It's a seed that must be sown in order to see a door open up in your family. You want to know why more people have strongholds, why some of your friends, your family, they're not saved, they're not serving Jesus, they're not going to heaven? It's because they don't have the gospel. Nobody's bringing it to them. Nobody's opening up the door for them. The Bible says in Romans 10, 14, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. How can this area, how can your family, how can your friends believe and be saved if they don't have the gospel? And how are they going to get the gospel if you don't bring it to them? How is the door going to be open for revival if we are not preaching the gospel? The world does not need you to invite them to your church. They need the gospel. They need Jesus. They need the Savior. Joab opened the door for David to rush in and take the stronghold. David went in, he took that stronghold down. The question this morning is, will you open the door for Jesus? How many here truly want to see revival? How many here want to see blind eyes open and the lame walk and wheelchairs getting thrown down and crutches being thrown down? That's revival. How many want to see that? How many want to see garbage cans full of cigarette packs and alcohol bottles and drugs that people are throwing down because God is moving into place and God is convicting people and drawing people to repent and be saved? I want to see that. I want to see people getting out of wheelchairs. I want to see it. I want to see heaven like we sang about this morning. That's not just something I just sing. I want to see it. And I'm willing to take the proper steps to see it. I want to see revival. Success to me is not having a large church full of people still in their shackles. That's not success. You look at man and you say, man, that guy's got 60,000 in his church. He's got 60,000 prisoners in his church is what he's got. I didn't give my life to fill a building full of prisoners. I gave my life because I want to see the kingdom. I want to see the kingdom where the, the blind see and the lame walk. I want to see the kingdom where people are raised out of wheelchairs. I want to see the kingdom where people are getting healed and marriages are getting restored. I want to see the kingdom. I want to see revival. And I'm not selling for less. I am not selling for good church services. I am not selling for good worship services. I want to see the king of glory come into this area. I want to see it. Do you want to see it? Stand with me.